It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of Friday the 13th of June 2003. We've got three films to look at today, so let's go ahead and get right to it. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend. I guess big in quotation marks, because this was not a big hit. In fact, it was seen as kind of an underperforming film, if not a bomb, and that is, of course, the Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries meeting up for the first time ever in Rugrats Go Wild. Ah, the days when the Nickelodeon movie was promoted on a competing network and they didn't want to show the logo by any means necessary of Nickelodeons. So, I always found that kind of amusing. And even the post that I have here on the on my written review actually has the Nickelodeon logo taken out of that as well. So, uh, I just find that kind of amusing. But since the Rugrats and the Wall Thornberries made the successful transition to the big screen and it would make some sense if they had their paths crossed, Nickelodeon decided to make a, the third Rugrats movie a crossover film with the Wild Thornberries, and thus we have said film. And of course, as the plot indicates, uh, the Rugrats go on a cruise, their ship gets uh, capsized during a storm, end up on the same island as the Wild Thornberries, and of course, the chaos and hilarity ensues from there. And, um, you know, with Rugrats in Paris and Wild Thornberries being vast improvements over their TV shows, this movie in particular feels like a major step down in comparison to both shows and what both preceding movies had brought to you know, kind of expand the characters and stories on, uh, in both of those films, but they've gone back to more of a formula of approach that's been done to death over and over again, and I'm sorry, I'd rather, I'll stick with the Jetsons meet the Flintstones, or when the Simpsons meets Family Guy, thank you very much, because this is about what you would expect from a film like this, but then again, it could get by with some of the interactions between not the characters having some entertainment value to them, and they do, at least some of them, even if they try to make you think some characters from one show that have the same characteristics or character traits from other shows, you know, they just cram in it, which they just cram in here, like, it, would anyone even compare Angelica to Debbie? I mean, I never made that connection before, heck, Chucky being compared to Donnie, mostly because they have the same hair, but different color, I mean, and then when you have a movie that's being sold off by having Bruce Willis as the voice of Spike whenever Elias around him, it honestly works a lot better than I thought it would have been, and it would have given Will's credit for it. I mean, I'm hearing the voice of John McClane coming out of Spike the Dog from the Rugrats. It's a concept that's so hilarious and stupid, and it works, again, for the most part. I mean, there are those ridiculously corny throwaway lines, like if they're trying to talk down to the audience or saying some pretty childish lines, like there's pointless references, like the last line Spike has in the movie is, as dog is my witness, I'll never lose my babies again. And it's just like, eh. Like, Lack of creativity there, to say the least. And also, Spike kind of takes over for Darwin, pretty much, as Eliza's sidekick. He's just pushed... Darwin's literally just pushed off to the side of the movie. He barely has anything to do in this film whatsoever. Like, he has two to three lines in this whole movie, and that's it. The rest of it is just him screeching. Like, they, they completely tossed him off to the side because Spike's right there, so just replace the monkey with the dog, I guess. And the adventure really isn't that exciting, either. And that's the worst thing about this movie. We're just watching the babies just walking around the jungle, and that's it. Nothing interesting happens until we get to the third act when you see... We start to get into the action and adventure when you have the Cloud of the Leopard after them. And even then, there's really not a whole lot there. There's more adventure in the first two Rugrats movie, co movies compared to this film. And this one gets the PG rating because more adult humor, I guess. They gotta throw that in there, but... um. And then there's the big climax at the end, which is really, really lackluster because it's a situation where you know there's a big subplot where Nigel sees the babies at first he falls off of a mountain gets hit by a coconut and he thinks he's a baby and so that's why the Rugrats can understand him at fir first and there's a situation where they get stuck inside this bathosphere and they're trying to go for some realism here I get it but these are just long drawn out scenes where Nigel's just keeping up hope and oxygen taking away and it goes on for 20 minutes and this is an 81 minute movie I mean this is this is a th this is about one-fourth of the whole movie. And halfway through it, I was just like, all right, we get it, just wrap it up already, because it was going on for so long, and nothing was going on. Like, this is a film that should have been, had a lot more, it has a lot more ambition to it, but it just never delivers on any of it whatsoever. It's like the Hey Arnold movie from the year before. It was supposed to be a, mo a TV movie at one point, but unlike Hey Arnold, they shelved everything that ha they had and started from scratch, and even then, that still couldn't prevent the movie from being a gigantic letdown in the end. I mean, you could have had something exciting with these, but overall, it's a drag. And unfortunately, it just ends the Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries movies on a bad note. 
And the box office wasn't really helping it either, and neither was the fact that they literally had a, a smell of vision format placed into this with Odorama. Like, you could get these cards at the movie theater, and you're supposed to scratch the cards, and you smell like, you could smell like different, it's like there's a thing we could smell. Phil Speed, if you're interested. You can smell De uh, Debbie's Root Beer. You can, like, smell all these different things. It's just like, why do I want to smell any of that? Like, there's a reason why that format died, only to be briefly revived with Spy Kids all the time in the world. And even then, that didn't work then either. But, um, yeah, this is just a bad way to go off of both the Rugrats and the Wild Thrillers. Plus, the zeitgeist for both of these series had kind of pretty much died off. As SpongeBob pretty much took over as Nickelodeon's premier state, premier state, premier a mascot as a whole, but yeah, this is just a mess. This is just a messy, messy film on so many levels. But, um, so that's Rugrats Go Wild. So let's go ahead and take a look at our next movie, which is Hollywood Homicide. So in the film, you have, uh, when they're not solving murders in Tinseltown, you have Harrison Ford as a detective and his rookie partner, played by Josh Hartnett, who both moonlight in other fields. Um, Harrison Ford's character sells real estate poorly, and um, Josh Hartnett's character aspires to become an actor. Assigned to the vicious in-club slang of a promising young rap act, the two te detectives delve into the recording industry, where they hope to find the answers, ideally ones that are complete with uh, property bu buyers or auditions. This film gets kind of a bad rap, but I'm not going to lie. I kind of admire this movie. I actually do find it kind of funny. It's actually based on uh, supposed true experiences of one of the writers, Robert Souza, who was actually a homicide detective in the LAPD Hollywood division and was moonlighting as a real estate broker in the last couple of years of his job. So I thought it was kind of intriguing how they, how they put, took that and decided to make a comedy out of it. The film gets kind of a bad rap because it does have a lot of subplots that don't really go anywhere. And... Yeah, that's kind of true, but kind of like with National Security, what makes it work is how the two leads work off each other. I thought they worked off each other very well, despite the fact that they really did not like each other in real life. Plus, it's funny just seeing Harrison Ford go crazy at times in this movie. Like, you see in the trailers where he's yelling at somebody for a, kid, for a bike to, to go, go chase the bad guys in, and then there's a scene where they're in an interrogation room, and he's just thrusting himself in front of the... In front of what, the uh, the police officer played by Bruce Greenwood, who's sleeping with his girlfriend, and he, you know he's just going, "Can you no way?" Like, like it's fun seeing Indiana Jones go crazy and do something outside of his norm. I mean, at least to me, I thought it was, but um, but I thought it was a fun movie. I think it's a very, inf I think it's a very funny movie. It's not the best written story, story wise, but sometimes you can just watch a movie like this and say. Did I have a good time with it? Absolutely. I had a good time with National Security. I put that in the same. I put those two movies in the same category. They're not the best written stories. They're movies we've seen done to death so many times. But I had a good time. I actually had a lot of fun laughing at some of the ridiculousness and the stupidity of it. But I loved it. I thought it was a. I thought it was a ton of fun. Okay, maybe loved a little bit of expression too much, but I like it a lot better than I think a lot of people put on it. Um, I think it's a lot better. It certainly is a lot better than Ron Shelton's other movie he made this year with Dark Blue, which, that was just a, a mess of a film. But this, I thought this was a ton of fun. Um, I wish I could say that for our last movie here, but, um, okay, maybe there's a couple of things in this one, but, but most of this is just a bad film. This is Dumb and Dumber, or When Harry Met Lloyd. So it's the 1980s, 1986 to be exact, and it's the moment that Lloyd Christmas and Harry Dunn meet. Lloyd Christmas is played by Eric Christian Olsen, Olsen, who would later go on to have a much more successful career in NCIS, in the NCIS series, but, um, and then the, act, the actor playing Harry Derek Richardson has not really done a whole lot since then, a couple of TV shows here and there, but they play Lloyd and Harry, and the two individuals are seen by many as special and become best friends as soon as they meet. Principal Collins, played by Eugene Levy and his lover, the lunch lady, Mrs. Heller, played by Sherry O'Terry, wants to make as much money out of scams, and the next idea is to create a special needs class. Miss Heller is the teacher, and they have assigned Harry and Lloyd to round the special students up, which includes Shia LaBeouf, because, you know, forget what, forget the great the great promise he showed in Holes. Here's a movie where he really does not have a whole lot to do in here. Um, school news reporter Jessica, played by Rachel Nichols, that Rachel Nichols from the G.I. Joe movies, is suspicious, though, and desperately tries to find out the truth, even if it means gaining Harry and Lloyd's help. So there's a lot of notable names in here, not just the ones I mentioned, but Louis Guzman, Julia Duffy, um, uh, who else is in here? Tim Stack, Brian Posehn, um, 
uh, Bob Saget, which I'll get to him in a minute because he's probably part of the biggest scene in the entire film, the most memorable scene in the entire film, I should say. Uh, Mimi Rogers, I mean, there is a decent cast in here in general. All have gone on to better things since after this because, um, why do we even need to sh sugarcoat it? This movie is bad. Like, I mean, it's a t it's a bad movie. It's not funny. It's not clever whatsoever. Even for a movie that's supposed to be considered really dumb, this is too dumb for its own damn good. I mean, this is a film that is just so lazy and so uninspired and just so pointless. Like, there's no reason to make this movie. You can't expect me to believe that these two guys are going to grow up to be the T Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels six is eight years after this movie. The set pl set piece comes into pl play because this is, takes place in '86, and that came out. In, the original Dumb and Dumber came out in '94, and um, yeah, and uh, it's just it's just a bad film per se. And it's funny because this movie probably would have had a chance if they had gone with the original route that they had, because supposedly they were going to get Trey Parker and Matt Stone to write the script for this, but because of scheduling conflicts, they opted out of the project and basically had to return the salary they had they got from New Line Cinema back and. What could have been, because they probably could have saved this movie, it prob not by a whole lot, but it probably would have been a whole lot better than it actually is, which, it's a terrible film on so many levels, but it does have one memorable scene in it that actually does kind of work in the film's favor, and that is the scene with Bob Saget, who plays uh, uh, Rachel Nichols' father in here, and it's a scene where... It inv it's, it's funny because it's another. It's like the first movie. The most member, one of the most memorable scenes involves a poop and poop all over the poop. Except in this, in the original, it was Jeff Daniels having di explosive diarrhea. But in this, it's just Bob Saget screaming, "There's shit everywhere!" I mean, and again, this is Bob Saget, the guy who made his career off of stuff like America's Funniest Home Videos and Full House, and then he does something like Dirty Work, and then this, and it's just like, you know. Look, he's a is there's a reason why he was called America's filthiest family man. I mean, he, he was, I mean, he has the most memorable scene in the movie, and it's just nothing but him screaming, "There's shit everywhere!" And just the way he's screaming it, it's just it's just perfect. Like it's just one of the it's the it's that one brief flash of something really hilarious from something really stupid that works in the film's favor, and that it just. It just it's just just the one thing that this movie has going for it. But everything else about it is just... Let's just put it this way. The director of this is the same man that gave us the Hollywood, the holiday asset that is Jack Frost. The Michael Keaton one. The one where Michael Keaton dies and turns into a snowman. a badly CG snowman. That should have been the warning sign that this was not going to work out. And um, But um, despite all that, it was still a hit. Like It wasn't as a big of a hit as the original Dumb and Dumber, but... The thing only cost $19 million to make and did make its budget back, but doubling it by $40 million to $40 million. So they did kind of make their money. It did end up being somewhat successful when it was all said and done. But even then, it's just kind of like, was it really worth it? I mean, was it really worth it to do to do this film? I mean, I guess because, I guess because this came out, they eventually decided, okay, we're finally going to make the sequel, Dumb and Dumber 2. About 11 years later, which it's better, but not by that much. I'll delve more into that when we get to 2014. But um, I mean, at least that's better than this film. This was just there's nothing more I gotta say about it, man. This is just not a good movie whatsoever. It's just a film that's just really, really, really bad, and it's not even hiding the fact that it's completely pointless. But um, I really got nothing else for you. That's Dumb and Dumber when Harry met Lloyd. But the bad movies don't stop there, because as we wrap up this episode of Time About the Movies, we have we take a look at the preview for next week, and um, here's the here's the menu for next week. Angley's Hulk, which is, I think that speaks for itself. Uh, Kate Hudson and Luke Wilson, and Rob Reiner's Alex and Emma, which could go either way, but then we wrap it up with, um, From Justin to Kelly, the second reality movie, except unlike the real Cancun, this was actually a scripted film. Does it make it better? Probably not, but it's another, I guess you could kind of call it a shit sandwich next time. <laughs> we'll take a look and see if that is indeed the case with these next three movies on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the plays on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel.
and stay right where you are because um, actually you can move around if you want to. But uh, after I get done posting this, uh, there'll be a brand new time about the movie's flashback coming up later on tonight, which includes seven movies from the middle of March of 1988, including Police Academy 5, Assignment Miami Beach, DOA with Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan, Little Nikita, Dominique and Eugene, The Milagro Beanfield War, Beatrice and Aria. I don't know why I'm saying it like that, but those are the movies that we're going to be taking a look at. And we will take a look at those movies right after this.